The World to Come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. We have been examining the truth of being born again. Millions have been deceived about the meaning of plain verses in the Bible on this subject. In part one, we laid crucial foundation with basic scriptures that reveal the time element of when a Christian is born again, along with God's ultimate purpose for human beings. So many have been led astray by the false born-again teaching, along with the truth of when and how one enters the kingdom of God. Continue viewing this series to learn more about this important topic. We previously introduced prophecies in Daniel regarding the final world-ruling empire that will be replaced by God's government at Jesus Christ's return. Let's now lay more foundation. The Bible reveals that God's government, His kingdom, once ruled the earth. But what happened? The first verse of the Bible states, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The book of Job also describes when God created the world. God asked Job a series of questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who has laid the measures thereof, if you know? Or who has stretched the line upon it? When the morning stars, it says, sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. These stars, here called sons of God, were angels. Read Revelation 1.20 and 12.4. Of course, actual heavenly stars do not sing. Notice it says all of them shouted and sang together. Job reveals the earth was created in a wonderful, beautiful condition, with angelic joy and singing. Lucifer and his angels had not yet rebelled at the time of the Genesis 1-1 creation. Genesis 1-2 is mistranslated and does not reflect the meaning of the original Hebrew. The King James Version of the Bible states, And the earth was without form and void. Three key Hebrew words are all mistranslated here, thus obscuring and actually hiding the verse's true meaning. The word translated was is hayah. In Genesis 2-7, this word is correctly translated became, and in Genesis 9-15, become. The words for without form and void are tohu and bohu. Correctly translated, they mean chaotic, in confusion, waste, and empty. In short, a perfectly created earth, verse 1, became chaotic and confused, verse 2. In effect, the next verse shows the way God did not create the earth. Notice, for thus says the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain. Again, tohu, meaning chaotic or waste. He formed it to be inhabited. The earth became chaotic after God created it between the events of Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. The latter verse describes the earth's recreation 6,000 years ago. Verse 1 describes the original creation of the entire universe that scientists say occurred as many as 14 billion years ago. We know what happened, but how did it happen? How did the earth go from being beautiful and perfect to chaotic, confused, waste, and empty? Since God is not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14.33, we know He did not destroy it. Then who or what did? Psalm 104, verse 30, states that God renews the face of the earth. During the creation week, God repaired, renewed, a damaged, injured earth, then covered with water. Lifted with pride, seeking to replace God, the devil brought this devastation. Acts 3, verses 19 to 21, reveals that Jesus Christ's return brings the restitution, or restoring, of all things. But Satan is still the god of this world and would continue to be had Christ not qualified to replace him. Satan demonstrated he could not be governed by God. 
So a successor had to qualify to replace him because Satan's government was still in place on earth. Almost immediately after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, he entered an extraordinary and extended battle with Satan. Successfully resisting the devil's temptation was the key to Jesus overcoming sin and qualifying to replace him at the establishing of the kingdom of God. Matthew 4 contains the account. Then was Jesus, it says, led up of the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. Through enticement, the devil repeatedly tempted Christ and in various ways. Read the account. The account climaxes after several attempts to break Christ's will. After being offered all the world's kingdoms by Satan, Christ rebuked him and commanded him to leave. The temptation ended and the devil departed. Christ had successfully resisted and qualified. He passed a very real test. He overcame the world, his own flesh, and the devil in defeating sin and qualifying to pay for the sins of the world. Though Jesus qualified to replace Satan almost 2,000 years ago, there are several reasons for the long delay in establishing God's kingdom. God's plan encompasses 7,000 years. Few understand this. Numerous verses describe Christ's 1,000-year reign, which begins at His return with the saints. A few more understand this much, but know nothing of the fact that God has allotted 6,000 years, or six millennial days of a seven-day week, to man's rule prior to the seventh 1,000-year day. The sixth day is drawing to a close. Satan is soon to be bound. Read Revelation 20, verse 2. Man has been given much time to try his own ways, governments, religions, philosophies, value systems, forms of education, and methods of trying to solve the world's greatest problems. Under the sway of Satan, man has practiced sin, disobedience to God's commands for all this time. Then he's tried to treat all of the ill effects instead of the cause, breaking God's spiritual laws. God is permitting man to learn bitter lessons. The vast majority, who have never known the precious truth of God, are having to learn that their own ways and solutions to problems do not work. Having conquered sin, Jesus qualified to replace the God of this world, as the Bible calls Satan. He assured that the devil will soon no longer be able to deceive and confuse mankind. Having not yet been bound, Satan does everything within his power to thwart God's plan. His deceived ministers teach, in effect, that God has failed to save the world. Yet, only by God's permission does Satan hold sway over what is called this present evil world. Recognize God is not losing some sort of cosmic wrestling match with Satan. In fact, he is in full control. He knows exactly what he is doing, and the beauty of his plan can be known. No true God would ever condemn humanity without offering salvation to everyone. There are other reasons for the delay in Christ's return. He had to first call and train the original disciples to become apostles, to become part of the church's foundation, see Ephesians 2.20, and to take the true gospel to the world. Then, throughout the New Testament period, he had to train a larger administrative team to rule with him. Jesus did not establish his kingdom immediately because he had to ascend to heaven to become high priest of those God calls. Christians are reconciled to God by Christ's death, but they are saved by his life, his resurrection, see Romans 5 and verse 10. Also, while still human, Jesus could not install himself as Satan's replacement. We saw that Daniel recorded he had to return to heaven to be crowned before he could return. The master deceiver has inspired many false religions, but also counterfeited the truth in endless ways. The fruit of his efforts lies everywhere. But man's 1,000-year Sabbath rest is coming soon. Man will then be forced to rest from sin and from Satan's relentless deceit. Mark 2.28 states, The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. 
When the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, comes to bind Satan, his dominion will end and the world will rest from sin. The then spirit-composed saints, born of God, will rule. It is no surprise that Satan deceives the world about the saints being born from the dead. He knows their first order of business will be to remove him. Physical kingdoms have people with governments over them. God is no different. John 4.24 states that God is a spirit. Under the Father, Christ leads his kingdom composed of spirit beings. At his return, Christ, as a member of the family of God, will have many younger brothers and sisters, the same as the many brethren referenced in Romans 8.29 we learned of, who will have also qualified to rule with him. There is a plant kingdom, an animal kingdom, human kingdoms, and an angelic kingdom. There is also God's kingdom. In Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Referring to themselves, the one speaking uses us and our. The Hebrew word here for God is Elohim. It is a uniplural term like group, team, committee, or family. These represent one entity comprised of several members or persons. Thus, the Bible teaches that there is one God composed of two persons, the Father and Christ, with many more to be added later. The first time God will add more sons to his family is when Christ's kingdom is established. At that time, many sons shall be brought unto glory through the captain of our salvation. And Jesus, we saw, is not ashamed to call them brethren. He is called firstborn among these brethren. Do you grasp this? A true Christian's goal is to be born into the kingdom or government of God as a spirit being to rule under Christ. What could be more wonderful, more glorious to look forward to? Throughout his ministry, when Christ taught about the kingdom, he was actually teaching about the family of God and how humans may enter it by being born again. The Bible teaches God's kingdom will rule over the people and nations of earth. The nations are not actually part of that kingdom any more than the citizens of any country are part of the government that rules them. We saw one must enter the kingdom to be in it, as distinct from those governed by it, who is actually in God's kingdom. Recall that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. This is a mystery to almost everyone, that flesh and blood human beings cannot enter the kingdom of God. Only at the resurrection are Christians changed, born again, from flesh to spirit. If we just believe the plain truth of the Bible, God's kingdom cannot include physical people. But exactly when does the change from physical to spirit composition occur? Here is the answer. We shall not all sleep, Paul wrote, meaning remain dead, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. But to what? Paul continues with this easy to understand explanation. The first man is of the earth, earthy, a physical human. The second man is the Lord from heaven, a spirit God being. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall in the future at the resurrection also bear the image of the heavenly. And this corruptible, flesh is certainly corruptible, must put on incorruption. Those born of God are spirit, and this mortal must put on immortality. It is at this point that flesh is changed into spirit. Genesis 2-7 states, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Human beings are composed of flesh, of the dust. God will change their flesh to spirit at the resurrection. Those entering the kingdom must be composed of spirit. Let's examine this further. Jesus taught, 
For in the resurrection they, the saints, neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. Hebrews 1.7 shows angels are made of spirit. This is important to understand about one's future composition in the resurrection. Do not misunderstand. Jesus was not saying the resurrected saints would actually be angels. He merely meant the saints would be as the angels, in that neither marry. This is what Nicodemus could not comprehend. Jesus had to explain it to him, as did Paul to the Corinthians, that we will all be changed at the resurrection. No one can see or enter the kingdom until Christ returns and establishes it. Before continuing, we need to examine immortality from a different perspective. Understand, the immortal soul doctrine states that everyone is already immortal. But what about this verse referencing God and Jesus Christ? It says, who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. If God and Christ are the only ones with immortality, this leaves no room for people to possess immortal souls. People are not born with immortal souls. Read these verses and know there are others that could be included. Notice this instruction, God's perspective on immortality, to would-be Christians. Seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. If people already have immortality, God will not tell them to seek it and that their mortal bodies must put on immortality at the resurrection. Human beings do not have life inherent within them. Your life will span a certain allotted time after which you will die. That is absolute, Hebrews 9.27. Unless God intervenes, you have no future, no hope beyond a limited time of about 70 to 80 years. Stop believing the fables of men about immortal souls. This fiction is not taught in the Bible. Matthew 5.5 5 states that the meek, true Christians, inherit the earth and rule with Christ. But how does one become an heir with Christ? A single verse exists that defines a Christian, but it is not the popular idea taught in the so-called Christian world. This verse also introduces being heirs. First notice. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Christians have the Holy Spirit leading them. Having God's Spirit is absolutely essential to being a Christian. Some verses earlier, it states, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is, get this, none of his. It is that simple. One either has the Spirit of God and is a Christian, or does not have it and is not a Christian, is none of His. All who are truly converted have the Holy Spirit in them. This much is clear. What is not so clear or even known is this, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. The Bible reveals a connection between sons and heirs and being glorified together. An heir has not yet inherited what is to come to him. Christians will one day inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible says. But those called now in this lifetime are heirs, begotten sons, not yet born, Paul explains, if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed, or children, and heirs according to the promise. Wherefore, you are no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. A true follower of Christ in the Bible is an heir with Christ. An heir is one who later inherits what has been promised to him. We have seen that Christians inherit God's kingdom at Jesus' return when they are changed. But what does this mean? It means you must receive God's Spirit. But how? Most believe there are no requirements, no conditions to salvation. This is not 
true. There are three preconditions that must be met just to receive the Holy Spirit. On the day Jesus established the New Testament church, Peter gave a powerful sermon. 3,000 were baptized. Just before, many asked, what shall we do? Peter instructed, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is God's plain command to, one, repent, and two, be baptized in this order to receive the Holy Spirit. Recall from Mark 1, 14 and 15, that Jesus taught one must also, three, believe the gospel of the kingdom of God. From baptism forward, the new convert is begotten and led by the Holy Spirit. What does begotten mean? As explained, one receives the Holy Spirit at baptism through the laying on of hands. At this point, the Christian is begotten by the Father just as Christ was begotten in Mary by the Father. At begettal, a Christian takes on the mind of Christ who now lives in him. These two booklets, What Do You Mean Water Baptism and What Is True Conversion, present much more detail on these vital subjects. You will want to read them. We can understand spiritual begettal by examining the process of physical human begettal. Life begins when the father's sperm unites with the mother's ovum. In the reproduction process, an egg must be fertilized by a sperm cell. It then becomes sealed off, unable to be refertilized by another sperm. Human life begins as an embryo, develops into a fetus, and eventually grows and matures toward birth about nine months later. Begettal, development, and parturition separation from the womb, are entirely separate phases of the process by which each human being progresses toward birth. A fertilized egg is not a born human being. Similarly, a spirit-begotten human is not a born spirit being or person, as Christ became after His resurrection. How plain! God has carefully created an unmistakable comparison a parallel between human birth and divine birth at the time of the resurrection. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, is a physical human being, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, is a divine spirit-composed being. There is an all-important time element to both human and Christian development. Both involve a gestation period. With humans, the role of the father is complete at fertilization, but the mother's role continues for nine months. She must carry the child to birth. Everyone understands this process of development. No one confuses begettal with birth. If you doubt this, just try telling it to an abortion rights activist. These people view birth as everything and see begettal as having no meaning or importance and barely acknowledge it as part of the process. In this way, even deceived abortionists recognize a clear distinction between begettal and birth, but, tragically, they use it to commit outright mass murder of completely innocent and defenseless babies, for which evil they will give account to Almighty God, and probably now very soon. Why then do so many think that professing or accepting Jesus automatically leapfrogs them to the point of spiritual birth without gestation and development? No one speaks of pregnant women as already having new babies. Why can't professing Christians comprehend such basic understanding? Why can they not see the critical time element, so essential to human development, as necessary also for spiritual development? For more fascinating detail about human begettal and the parallels to receiving God's Spirit, read my full book, Sex, Its Unknown Dimension. It is unlike any other you have read on the subject. Now understand this point. The very same Spirit dwelling in us from baptism and conversion raises us, those who are begotten, to join God in His kingdom. Paul describes how spiritual begettal, 
when the Holy Spirit enters, leads to the time of one's second birth to spiritual composition, when one is born again. Let's carefully read. If the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. The very Spirit of God in us will allow us to awaken the resurrection. What Paul told the Corinthians about how they would be changed at the resurrection parallels what he told the Romans about how their physical bodies would be quickened by God's Spirit in them from conversion. One final related point has a direct bearing on when one is born again. Human babies can no longer abort after delivery. This possibility is only a danger, whether by accident, deliberate killing of the fetus, or other reasons, prior to birth. Get this straight. Only those with the Spirit of God have the potential for eternal life. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. Christians can abort. If one has God's Spirit, and then through neglect or willful sin loses it, he has aborted. In the truest sense, a Christian can miscarry, just like a human fetus, if he does not continue in the right path, if he does not endure to the end. As with humans, such aborting is final. In this way, the parallel between physical and spiritual development in the womb, gestation, expands. Notice, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. This is most serious for those who ignore the warning of this verse. Those who think themselves already born again are either ignorant of or refuse to accept the grave caution explained in these verses. Physical embryos are a type of spirit embryos, but the two are, of course, not identical. There are some obvious differences. Spirit embryos are developing toward a higher plane of life than physical ones, life that includes being made of invisible spirit, ability to travel through air and at unlimited speed, inability to sin, eternal life, and other spiritual capabilities. After two parts, there is still much more to learn about being born again. In the meantime, you can begin reading this thorough booklet, What Does Born Again Mean? In part three of this vital series, we will examine what Christians will be like once they are born again. We will also carefully examine the Greek used in key verses, along with more about the spiritual begettal process. When these are clearly understood, and you will have no doubt after we have examined them, many of the remaining shackles from the wrong understanding simply drop away. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To learn more or to find a local congregation, contact us to receive a personal response from a minister.